Welcome to the Women in Vinyl podcast with Jen DiEugenio, founder of Women in Vinyl and contributor Robin Raymond. This podcast facilitates conversations with those working in the vinyl record industry to educate, demystify, and diversify the vinyl community. Thanks for listening to episode 33 of the Women in Vinyl podcast. You just heard Inferno by Rosie Finch off their new record, Seconda Morte, an atmospheric journey of sludge and stoner grooves and 90s era alternative. Huge thanks to the band and friend Lay Bear Recordings for the use of the song. Check out www.laybearrecordings.com to order this and other wonderfully heavy records. Today we're joined by Allison Wolf, who really needs no introduction, but you may know her as songwriter, singer, writer, and podcaster. She is also a founding member of, and lead singer of the punk rock band Bratmobile. Allison is one of the leading voices of the Riot Girl movement and one of the reasons we can exist today. She was a joy to speak to, and we can't wait to share this conversation with you. Allison, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me here virtually. Yeah, you're sort of like an icon to our organization. So oh, <laughs> yeah, really? we, yeah, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you at, at all. So oh, we're, we're, cool. we're very, very, very geeked. Oh, <laughs> yeah. okay, cool. Anyway. Yeah, thank, thanks for letting me harass you on Instagram. <laughs> oh, no, it's all good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, it's I'm happy to be here. It's cool to do stuff that's you know other with other women's collectives and things so i'm like i said i'm sure that everybody listening um already knows who you are but for those that don't could you tell everyone a little bit about you and your career okay um my name is allison wolf and um i was around doing the i guess i was co-founder of riot girl with you know other women it wasn't just me for sure um and i grew up in olympia washington um, I was in a band called Bratmobile. I sang in that band, um, which was my first band, um, along with Molly Newman, the drummer, and Aaron Smith, the guitarist. And um, I did uh, a lot of other bands after. <laughs> um, anyways, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, my father's from Tennessee, and my mother is originally from Ralston, Nebraska, which is right in Omaha, basically. And... Um, my uh yeah anyways i don't know i have a twin sister identical twin oh, cool. sister yeah named cindy and she lives in toronto canada oh on my side how about yeah. that yeah have you guys used that to your advantage ever I feel um, like... <laughs> people always ask that um you know actually one time i we did swap um driver's licenses so that I think it was because I was on the guest list for Joan Jett concert <laughs> in Seattle, but I was flying back to DC and couldn't make it. So my sister wanted to go and we just didn't want to bug Joan and deal with, you know, changing it. So I just gave her my, we swapped IDs. That's awesome. <laughs> and so how did you get into music? Um, so, yeah, I, um, well, when I was in uh, grade school, actually, um, 
my sister and I were part of an after school program in uh, fifth grade that was um, called the Music Kids. And one of the oh. teachers ran it after school, Mr. Long. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it was like, um, like Music Kids, all one word with a big K in the middle. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it's, you know, whatever. Anyways, and it was kind of like jazz hands and little movements. And we would do like Neil Diamond and Jimmy Buffett songs and a yes. little bit of Beatles, I think. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Um, so my sister and I were part of that. And um, I don't know. I don't think I was particularly good. She got some solo parts. I didn't. But uh, <laughs> she's actually a better singer than I am. And I think a better songwriter. But <laughs> just saying. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, growing up in Olympia. Okay, so my parents left Memphis after they finished school. And we were born and stuff. And then um, <laughs> the t I also have a younger sister. She was born in Washington State. But um, so we they drove up to the north of Washington State and we settled in Mount Vernon, Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were there until we were about nine or 10 or something. And um, but my parents got divorced uh, when I was like seven or eight. And then my dad moved back to Tennessee. So and then my mother came out as a lesbian feminist. Um, vegetarian <laughs> All folk the things. singer part, you know <laughs> every now and then folk singer in the house yeah like hippie um so that was you know a big change um yeah. but uh, you know we and we she got custody custody of us kids so that's where we were so we stayed in washington state and then she went back to school she was already a nurse and was doing a lot of um innovative things um she i think she helped start like a women's birthing center in the hospital up there oh, in mount vernon yeah. That's awesome. But um, yeah, she was like OBGYN. Um, but then she ended up going back to school and uh, kind of getting um, a higher degree, becoming a n registered nurse practitioner. And um, and then she started dating, I think, her teacher in school. And, uh, <laughs> and that woman left her husband for my mom, I think. Wow. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we all moved down to Olympia. And that was like 1980 or something. And then my mother started the first women's health clinic in Olympia and in the county, Thurston yeah. County. Um, and it, I believe it was the only the second women's health clinic in Washington State. Wow. So, yeah. And she had to, you know, fight really hard for that. And I know mm -hmm. she worked really long hours and we were, you know, super broke for a long time. Um, and she was harassed constantly. Of like people course. were, con you know, always picketing and they I don't know. And the cops were always on the picketers side. And um, my mom, you know, and my mother was very out and very like, you know, didn't take Proud. any shit. So yeah. oh, can I say shit? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're fine. Okay. Please do. Please do. <laughs> but even back then, she had a really hard time securing a loan to start her business because she was a single woman. They're like, oh, we need your husband to co-sign. She's like, what husband? Yeah. So, you know, um, I think people don't realize those kind of things actually existed then, you know, yeah. and that's in the eighties, not that long yeah. ago, really. Well, yeah, I mean, not at all. even, but, and that's, you know, it's interesting. I have, um, this BRCA1 gene. So I had recently just got a hysterectomy and, um, they, in certain States still, you still have to have your husband sign off on it being okay for you to do that. It's oh, wild. Yeah, it's, and it's something that's a preventative surgery, and yet, oh man, still. even even up here in Canada, I I I mean, maybe it's your your mom sounds very much like my mom, where my mom was very much like a I work in a male dominated industry, and I don't take any shit from anybody, and I ra race stock cars and like that kind of stuff, where she was just like deuces, but like maybe maybe that's why we decided to do these weird things, but yeah, like she was. Um harassed a lot as i said but also mm. she did back then they didn't perform rape kits at hospitals and things so she was also on call all the time um to perform rape kits and yeah. you know as we know most rapes are not reported and all this yeah. kind of stuff and they certainly aren't don't usually go to court and all this stuff yeah. but my mother if things did she would support the woman and, and she'd be there the whole way and she would um sometimes you know, just testify in court and say, yes, I examined this woman. Here's what I found. Yeah. And she would get death threats wow. for that. 
from the men who would you know whether they were convicted or not but like you know of course yeah just it's wild so i don't know you know and and in the later years when people started when abortion doctors and stuff started getting killed um she wore a flap jacket she wore yeah she wore like a bulletproof jacket to work and she got trained to use a gun and she carried a glock in a fanny pack wow <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny and she's wow. a real she was such a good shot like really I, actually, <laughs> I mean so don't mess with her right so yeah. i mean i took actually that that class with her the gun shooting safety class yeah. or whatever and yeah. it was yeah first of all it's only a weekend i can't believe how like wimpy it is but anyways <laughs> but we did go to the firing range on the last day and I couldn't even pull the trigger on most of the guns. Like my finger wasn't strong. <laughs> Plus I was a total riot girl. I showed up in my riot girl skirt and barrettes. Totally. And my mom was like, had her baseball hat on, was chewing tobacco. <laughs> and was like, hurry up. I got to get back to the game. With her yellow glasses. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny. And then, I love it. But then because the cop was so impressed with my mom's abilities, he ended up handing me his Glock and he was like, try this. Because I couldn't pull the trigger, so I was like, "Oh, I can do this. It's like oh, a yeah. toy gun." So yeah. yeah, so she she was like, "Okay, I'm getting a Glock," and and then she had uh, yeah, and the pan, uh, what was it? The fanny pack, as we call it here. Yeah. I know we should, probably should call it something else. Bum bag. I don't know. <laughs> and she would pull this. She, she, it had a drawstring thing or whatever, where it would just open when Pop you pull open. the string. Yeah, and then you could grab the gun. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So oh she, man, she was ready. But um, yeah, but I mean, you know, it definitely taught us to question things, especially question like authority and the government and all that kind of stuff. I mean, not in the way that we talk about questioning the government now exactly, but um, but yeah, so definitely. But, you know, you still have to kind of rebel against your parents somehow. Right. right. So how do you do it? I mean, yeah. so we just. You know, I, it's more like you kind of just take all that stuff for granted. If you're surrounded by, you know, left wing and 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 just cool lesbians all the time, and you have like, you know, and and women's health care is a right and all this kind of stuff, yeah. um, then you don't realize that the rest of the world isn't so much like that. I mean, you kind of know, but it's you don't experience it until you leave yeah. town. So, anyways, but she, you know she my mother actually died um of ovarian cancer in 2000 sadly she was 55 so young wow. I'm so yeah sorry. i know and it's like it's just also the irony of a women's health care provider exactly. you know yeah. but they don't always well i i don't think i think with ovarian cancer honestly there's you don't catch it till it's too late so it's yeah. not that's it's why not her fault. Yep. that's why you did it right that's why i did it yep i wasn't gonna wait and see so I know I've thought about it, but oh, I don't know. I, <laughs> but I mean, whatever. Maybe I should. Like, who cares? I mean, but, I will tell you that the recovery was like shockingly fast. They sent me home the same day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Even, even in socialized Canada, like, I was like, they're like, are you awake? I'm like, yep. They're like, see you later. I was like, bye. <laughs> wow. See you later. Yeah. One thing that she said before she died was like, don't ever let your guard down regarding you know abortion and reproductive rights and all that kind of stuff and she was like watch they'll chip away at it and the minute you turn your back they'll take it from you and even then we were kind of like oh mom you know and then you know and then right after she died like first of all bush w comes in and you know gets to I don't know how many Supreme Court justices he put on, but I mean, we, he wasn't even popularly elected. No, and the, what, no. the Florida thing, what a scam. Jeb mm-hmm. Bush rigging the whole thing, you know? So it's like, yeah, it's insane what happened after that. And then now I just. I know. Straight up handmaid's tale. Yeah. 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 It's terrifying. It's yeah. terrifying. And now they want a federal, but like, they're just going for it. And you're like, this isn't the will of the people. By right. Law- no right. at, at all and so yeah. that's what we're dealing with is just anti-democracy it's like it'd be one thing if most of the people in this country felt that way then i'd get the hell out but no this is our country and it's not your christian right whatever it's not yours no right not at all. 
yeah. and you're stealing it by like really nefarious means you know it's like no this is awful it's not i don't know i it, and with the supreme court there it's that's a scam they're not elected they're there for life it, and they have so much power yeah right. and amy coney barrett who's not even like how does she even know what she's doing right, right. Well, <laughs> yeah. she's got one goal in mind but yeah she's a, a member of a cult so yeah. you're you're just like what the hell how can these people well that's exactly what trump's team focused on was getting judges all of his cronies in the right places because he knew that would be for life and the republicans yeah. knew that would be for life and women who support him and that you know the, that kind Those of endeavors. politics yeah. it doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense to me i'm no, like you are you completely don't understand what you're supporting then or they do and and you just want no even, rights i guess yeah, ma yeah it makes it even worse yeah well or it just makes you wonder what they're supporting like okay maybe they don't want their rights taken away but they're racist or whatever and they want uh, yeah. other people of color's rights taken away or whatever you totally. know yeah. so but also i mean it's just anecdotal but even in the south like well i don't know but tennessee <laughs> oh i'm so sad with some of their new set laws but um yeah. But, you know, my father, okay, he's a Republican, mm -hmm. but he's, <laughs> but he's pro-choice, you know, he was yeah. a doctor, he's, he, he's pro-choice. Um, and um, his wife, my stepmother, is a Democrat. And she told me that, you know, she's kind of in a small town in Tennessee. She doesn't have a lot of people with her on the political side. But she told me that at the, you know, group meetings and whatever book club and all this stuff she goes to she was like oh you'd be surprised like not almost none of the women in my groups who usually vote republican none of them like trump you know and she's like you'd be surprised how many women really hate trump and i'm assuming did not vote for him but yeah i don't know but um so we'll see but yeah exactly it's just like I, how i don't see how you really can politicize a woman's right right over her body exactly like how is that even political and then the COVID and the masks thing it's like how is that political right so back when the riot girl movement was starting mm -hmm. um what was that time like and did you know as it was happening that it would turn into what it has become uh, i think at some point well first of all you know i was in my like 19 20 21 like that so i think at that time in your life you kind of are really self-centered and it's like whoa we're the center of the world but no <laughs> but not really the world it's a small world um but yeah i mean well i went i went away to college so i went not very far but i went to eugene oregon and yeah. that's where i met molly newman who uh, we started bratmobile with yeah. and she was she's the drummer and um we just kind of, we were, she was very politicized already. She's from Washington, DC. And she was, would look at things more of a kind of national level and stuff, which I had never really looked at before. I'd right. only really thought about kind of maybe more basics or maybe just more local stuff, you know? Um, but anyway, so we kind of like, you know, Reese's put it together. Um, and we took a lot of very politicized classes and stuff at University of Oregon that, you know, we learned a lot from and we met a lot of cool student activists in the um, student center mm -hmm. and um, who really influenced us. And so but also we were musical and I kind of brought the whole Olympia K records, the, you know, little cassette tapes that had people just singing in their kitchens or whatever. <laughs> and that super DIY musical thing. So I kind of brought that to the table. And yeah. so we kind of meshed those things and was like, well and grunge was really big at the time in the northwest it might not have hit you know they say that you're a punk, punk broke what was that 91 or something but i mean already grunge in the late 80s was already happening i mean we may not have called it grunge but yeah. but i mean grunge was definitely big in the northwest already and we liked a lot of those bands but we uh, and we go to the shows mm -hmm. but we just felt like what's the message here and it was super matcha really and the shows you just kind of like okay now sexism um has like is wearing flannel and long hair okay yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we just felt like well we might not really know how to play or anything but we um 
will learn and we have something to say. And I still think it would be more interesting than some of this shit, you know? Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, going back to when you guys were kind of all putting your collective breaded heads together, is that when the zine started too? Like, is that when you guys decided like we're going to put some of our ideas down into a little doc and get it out to everybody? And because that's kind of was the a little bit of the genesis of the Riot Girl movement, right? Yeah. Well, we were um, very encouraged by people like Toby Vale, who I'd seen around town in high school at shows and stuff, and she was in an all girl band called Doris. I remember, and those girls also skated around town. They're skateboarders. And Donna Dresch, who later is Team Dresch, but at the time she was in some bands playing bass. And so, you know, there weren't a lot of women, but but there kind of were actually yeah. in Olympia. So you could see that and see them performing and stuff and, and making zines. And yeah. Donna and Toby both had zines, like, I believe in the late 80s even. And yeah. then, or, you know, and then Kathleen moved to Olympia the summer right before I or at least have been there that summer before I went to, away to college. So she moved there like 89 or something. Okay. And so I saw her, I remember seeing her around town, this tough girl, yeah. um, looked like tank girl. I remember at the time, um, <laughs> yeah, I'd see her on the bus and stuff, but also she ran a venue, um, oh. downtown and it was like kind of a evergreen, uh, state college, uh, kind of, I don't know, internship thing or something. Oh, cool. Yeah, so she ran this cool space. So I would also go to shows there. And yeah. um, but I but we never really talked to each other into like then at the time. Um, except for, you know, maybe paying to get in or something. Right. <laughs> oh, I think one time I was put on the guest list and she was so mad. And I said, Oh, I think I'm on the guest list. And she was so mad. And she was like, We can hardly make rent here you should pay yeah. she, so, she I, I thought she was gonna kill me so i was like i was so timid back then you know i was super timid so i was like oh okay sorry. here's my money and i and later i told the guy in the band who put me in the list and he was like uh and he was and then i found out years later when i you know after i was friends with kathleen that we were both dating that same guy at the same time oh my god <laughs> and i think that's part of why she wouldn't put me on i had no totally. idea i didn't know totally. i don't know <laughs> yeah. anyways but <laughs> so but yeah anyways but so then so once we were in eugene going to university of oregon uh, molly and i would come up a lot as often as we could because the scene really was not happening there right. um you kind of had to be in Washington state mostly, maybe Portland too, but, um, and so we would go to back to Olympia a lot and we started connecting with Toby and Kathleen and they had, were already starting Bikini Kill and we would just have lots of kind of politicized talks at, um, Toby's apartment maybe, or Kathleen's apartment or something. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And so they were very encouraging of us. And so they're the ones who said you should do a zine and, we were a band in theory for a long time. Actually, I remember we named our band right away. And so, and we were telling people we were a band for probably a year before we actually ever played. <laughs> um, and I remember Calvin Johnson from K, he called our bluff. Like he called us and said, hey, I want you guys to come up and play a show in Olympia. It was Valentine's Day, 1991. And you're going to open for Bikini Kill. And we were just like, what? We, we we don't know how to play what are you talking about and he's like you guys come up here at least once a month bragging about your band <laughs> and then we were like oh i guess we do here um, we go. <laughs> yeah. molly had taken some guitar lessons i think and she was really interested in drums so yeah we just ended up talking to this local eugene band called oswald Pivo and uh robert christie um from that band and we he gave us the keys to their practice space and said have at it here's the days that we were there so just go some other time and um yeah so they and then it's like well how do we write songs and he's like, <laughs> ours and he's like oh well, listen to some ramones records and i didn't have any ramones records so yeah. i remember just being like oh i'm not gonna listen to the ramones because i want to make sure we sound different i remember <laughs> reading this and i was yeah. like i wonder if she listens to the ramones now 
Not really. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Yes. Isn't it funny? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's so weird. But, <laughs> but that's kind of how contrary and we were, you know, just like, yeah, just stubborn, Brad. No, I, I, love, <laughs> and, I love it. Yeah. I love it so much. But well, so, and- yeah, I still don't own a Ramones record. I mean, I might have <laughs> had a CD that came my way at some point that someone just left it, you know, whatever. But yeah. But, yeah. but do you want to know what's funny? Is well, it's maybe not that funny, but we um, years later in Cold Cold Hearts, probably 96, 97, we were up in New- we would play New York a lot at the cooler. We were almost like the house band. And yeah. I think we were late for sound check at one point, and we were right in the I um is it Washington Square area where uh, the NYU is? Mm-hmm. And um, there yeah. used to be this JoJo's that all the punks would eat at right around there. And so we would get in the van and we're cruising and we're just flying and there's this, you know, like on crosswalk for university students, but it doesn't have a light or a stop sign or anything. You just kind of have to be ready. To stop. Maybe there's a stop sign. And all of a sudden it screeching halt and we almost hit someone. Oh, it seemed. And it was like, oh my God, what? And there's this guy slinking across <laughs> that like, you know, and he looks like a praying mantis. And we were just like, <laughs> Uh, and I was like, wow, he is beautiful. And then we realized it's Joey Ramone. Amazing. Yeah, we almost we almost ran over Joey. Mowed him down. <laughs> You're still like, I still don't have your record. <laughs> I, I don't like you this much. Uh, no, I mean, I like them. And of course, you know, I'll listen to it. If I, you know, I, whatever. But <laughs> You're not going to turn it off if it comes on. Well, no, right. I a just lot never of, owned it. A lot of the music it. of the time was punk. Um And I've heard people say today that music is becoming less genre based. And so I'm, I wonder how you feel about that. And if you think that there are certain bands that are still like standing up and speaking out. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about the genre based thing. Well, I guess you're right. There's just a lot more blending. I mean, I've never really been able to, you know, it's hard to describe music. So it's hard to even say genres really, but, um, but yeah, there's a lot of fusion, <laughs> whatever. Um, Crossovers. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's interesting. A lot of thing, interesting things has, have happened. Like, first of all, like, back when we started, uh, the media wasn't really writing about alternative or indie culture that much. I mean, there were alternative news weeklies that were more in the 90s, I think, later, maybe later in the 90s that were really doing, you know, strong. Yeah. and some college radio at that point too um but most mainstream media was not writing about that stuff at all or if they did they sounded so out of touch you know mm-hmm. <laughs> or they just hit the most mainstream of it or something yeah. but um so i think we really did feel like like in riot girl that we had to create our own platforms to have a voice you know mm-hmm. use the means of production to You know, you got to DIY, you got to do it yourself. So, and that's definitely why we were doing zines to have a voice and like, well, here's what I think. And here's what I want to say, or, you know, or here's a little scene report, or here's what I think is funny, whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, But yeah, and it's, and that kind of tactile, urgent thing of zines, you know, you have to get it out quickly because especially if you're going to say, oh, this show's happening. Yeah. (laughs) You got to get out quick. Yeah. Um, yeah, or it becomes old news pretty quickly. So um, yeah, I guess you have to make it more evergreen. But yeah, so I don't know. So that's, those are the kinds of things we were doing and, and what was important. Hold that thought. It's time for an Amanda fact. The first record cleaning machine was invented by Percy Wilson in 1965. Apparently, it was a massive multi-step behemoth of a machine and a process. Then three fellas, John Wright, Mike Belleville, and Pete Keeley came together to work out how to make the first commercially available record cleaning machine with the thought that large sound libraries like those held in radio stations would be keenly interested. Development took several years and the company was so overextended, it locked its doors and folded. A mere five days before their newly hired sales manager, Keith Monk, was scheduled to meet with the BBC executives. Keith Monk kept the meeting anyway. 
and he sold VBC on this product, hopeful that he could figure out somehow to get this machine made. Interestingly, today we think of the first record cleaning machine is being developed by Keith Monk, by his company called Keith Monk Audio Limited. But there's always more to the story. And now there are tons of different record cleaning machines on the market. How do you personalize your turntable? Maybe a slip mat of a favorite band, company, a women in vinyl slip mat perhaps? Well now you can create your own personalized slip mat with your pet's face, a family photo, your logo, and more using Glowtronics, a company taking your gear to the next level with full color print on demand slip mats. And yes, you can order just one. From cork to DJ quality, they have tons of options. Use code women in vinyl 15 at checkout to get 15% off. www.glotronics store.com. And now back to the episode. But I have a question about because I love hardcore, and hardcore is very much a macho who can lift more kind of I eat more steak than you or in the Ian MacKay kind of version like I don't eat any steak at all and I'm like <laughs> the most hardcore person of all time how uh -huh. did that intersect with the Riot Girl movement because it was kind of like at the same time you guys were a little bit after but like there's always kind of been a an undercurrent of hardcore from the east coast to the west coast I mean, I'm not real familiar with a lot of it, but I do know um, I'm friends with Alice Bag, um, mm -hmm. who's an original punk, well, LA, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, West Coast one. Um, and she, you know, she's, we've talked a lot about this stuff and I've read a lot of stuff she's said about it. But, you know, I, I think that that original quote unquote real punk or whatever was a short lived period, right? It was like late yeah. 70s, maybe early, early 80s. 80s. But yeah. one, for sure, by the mid 80s, a lot of, those originators felt done or they felt like hardcore took over totally. and completely like you know and it's like sexist racist um violent crowds and stuff like that and they're just like okay now it's white boy jock land yeah yeah you know yeah. yeah and homophobic and all this stuff yeah. so it's I a weird it's a weird space for me to be at that i love hardcore that much when some of the messaging is just so problematic but it's I don't know, man. <laughs> well, I would imagine it's somewhat different now, and that you do have women involved now. Yeah. Stuff. Maybe not enough, but um, it's never enough, is it? But you know, it's, right? it, yeah, it's never enough. Yeah. So I mean, what is it? There's this band, The War on Women. Are they hardcore? Would you consider them hardcore? I don't know. I'm not familiar with them, yeah. but I will definitely check them out. Yeah, I follow them on Instagram. I've never seen them, but I just thought, I was like, I like that band name. <laughs> I think they <laughs> might be hardcore. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah, they're from Baltimore, Maryland, formed in 2010. Here we go. Yeah, mm. they're cool. They seem cool. Um, there's a lot of stuff like Big Joni in the UK, mm -hmm. and there are label mates of of mine now. They're on Kill Rock Stars now, and awesome. um, yeah, and they're just great. And I did an interview with them for my podcast that I'm reviving. Yeah, I was just I was just gonna say let's let's pump the other podcast. Like, yeah, oh I'm, I'm in the band podcast that started yeah. in 2017. I don't yeah. Know. Oh, it's I loved it. So yeah, so um, I went back to school to USC Annenberg um, for school for journalism and did like a this specialized arts program. Uh, got got my master's in that. And me and one of my um, classmates, Jonathan Shiplett, we started a podcast for mm -hmm. Tidal. Um, and there was a woman, Brent, Brenna Ehrlich, who um, worked there and got us on board. And we did a year's worth of podcast episodes, once one a month for them. And we called it I'm in the band. And it's funny how many people confuse it with I'm with the band. Obviously, it was it's a takeoff of that, but it's being like, no, I'm not with the band. I'm not a groupie. I am in the band. No offense to groupies. <laughs> or or Miss Pamela. She's cool. But I, <laughs> yeah. But I'm just saying, you know, like that was my whole thing about getting into music was yeah. I'm in the band. And then also this thing that happens that even if once you if you are a marginalized person in any field, really, but it, here in this case, music in a band, 
how many times you still have to continue to prove that your entire yeah. career. I can't yeah. tell you how many times I walk into a club we're supposed to be playing that night and it's all like, who are you? Or doors aren't open, yeah. get out, yeah. whatever. You yeah. know, wait, who's your boyfriend? Whatever. You know, yeah, totally. <laughs> just like, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> and I think that's like, that's sort of an interesting segue to like, we find that a lot of women don't feel comfortable talking about how they're maybe like, objectified or they're not getting paid the same amount or whatever uh, it is just because the same opportunity yeah. yeah because of they're afraid to lose their jobs and i'm wondering if you have any sort of advice maybe for them on how to speak up and feel more comfortable talking about these kinds of things well, <laughs> I could I could give a kick down the door. It's a do as I say and not as I do thing. But um, <laughs> I, I, I'm a pushover and I've been I get taken advantage of easily. But um, I know that my first our first episode ever was with Danita Sparks from L7. And I know in her interview, she talked a lot about that kind of stuff where it's like, you know, and they were popular in the 90s, right? They were big hitters. And they had a hard time sometimes getting, I think on Lollapalooza, they couldn't get on and they were friends with all the other bands and they were like, whatever. And I think, I don't know if they did this or if they said they were going to do this, but something about flying a plane over Lollapalooza and saying, whose dick do we have to suck to get on Lollapalooza? Like <laughs> I mean, it's so funny, but you know, just like calling it out. I feel like, you know, obviously representation matters. We need to see ourselves reflected back so we feel like validated or our experiences are similar maybe or or you know and also to feel like you can do it too mm -hmm. um because everyone had to kind of kick down the door themselves a bit you know or carve their own path yeah or or at least something do something that was carving <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> something carvy <laughs> but yeah so i mean modeling the way for you was kind of like Kim Gordon, um, I mean, you've mentioned the slits already, uh, Kim Deal, like polystyrene, like we're talking yeah. icons on mm -hmm. icons on icons. And how were you finding those women? Like, was that filtering down through zine culture and tape trading? Or was that something that uh, yeah. somebody was like, oh, hey, you should check this out or... Yeah, well, back then you found out about music, either someone made you a mixtape and gave it to you or sent it to you in the mail, or yeah. you were sitting around at someone's house and they're playing records. Oh, have you heard this? Whatever, you know, yeah. and um, and Calvin Johnson was a big part of that. He would make mixtapes for people and he has an amazing record collection. And so he awesome. would make like girl fronted mixtapes for a lot of the riot girls. and stuff. Awesome. You know? <laughs> That's so awesome. But, but early on, um, actually, I was pen pals with uh, Rose. Wait, why can't I? Why? <laughs> from, Rose from Tiger Trump. Okay. And yeah, and, and she lives in Canada. Um, but she would send, we were, it was great. She would send me mixtapes with all sorts of cool girl bands. So she yeah. schooled me big time. And she also, um, I remember her once said drawing out chords on a guitar to show me the <laughs> oh, with, cool. and drew the hands. On, yeah. on the back of the guitar. That nice. was amazing. Um, stuff like that. But so that's how you, you know, you, we had to work hard to find our foremothers and stuff. Yeah. But some of the things I do remember was um, of course um, uh, decline of Western civilization. Mm -hmm. So I definitely remember seeing like Xene on that, and and Alice Bag really left the greatest impression mm -hmm. um, on that uh, movie mm -hmm. uh, or documentary. And then also, um, I remember like when we started telling these guy friends of ours and Eugene that we want we're a, we're a girl band or we want to where there's why aren't there more girls you know whatever just like that. And I remember one of the guys he was kind of a dick but he would be like. Yeah, there's girls. Look, here's Avenger, you know, and he sh showed me the Avengers seven inch or something, you know, and it's like, okay, yeah, no, I didn't know about it. Cool, you know, and yeah. so, I mean, or maybe I did, didn't, I don't know, but that was great. Actually, I just saw the Avengers last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Penelope, great. So, um, but Penelope Houston, yeah, it was an early influence, really. And, but I remember the way that guys would, 
they still had to be like the disseminators of the information. They had to be the one who tells you, the one who schools you, the yeah. one who shows you. Oh, you and, have that shirt named three songs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they, but they also, he also had to be like, to try to prove us wrong. Like, no, girls aren't discriminated against in punk because look at this example of mm -hmm. Penelope Houston. And it's like, okay that's just one you know yeah. it, it doesn't mean that things are equal you know exactly or, so yeah. it's just and to use it against me really right so <laughs> I remember what the first time I met her years later and I told her about that I don't think it came out right I wasn't trying to be like <laughs> oh the Avengers like were hard on me you know or were used yeah. against me but yeah <laughs> but it but it was just that way that backhanded way I ended up writing a song kind of about that stuff but how men feel often feel like they, yeah. Like, I don't know. Or even I interviewed Liz Fair um, for us. I did a story on her for a book, an anthology of women. It's called Women Who Rock. Um, but I also for, did an article in Bust that printed some of the interview. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she definitely was like men, like why are men, why were men always trying to t show me what's good and tell me what to listen to? And, you know, right. <laughs> Yeah. She has a lot of funny stories about that. It's just like, why why do they have to curate my taste or my records or whatever? Yeah. 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 Well, since we're coming up on our time here, I wanted to, oh, uh, we have some community questions. Mm -hmm. We're very excited. So um, Caroline207 Maine says, um, is there something you know now that you didn't when you started out? Oh God, everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I we didn't I didn't know about registering songs and music for a uh, long time. We uh -huh. were, you know, fairly late in the game to register our songs. Um that would have been nice. You know, like you don't even know what's available to you if some cuz people don't really tell you, right? Cuz yeah. they want to keep their everyone's hoarding the resources, you right. know. Yeah. So, anyways, um but also I think Sometimes I think like, I don't know. I mean, I know we were pretty politicized and we read a lot and, 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 you know, took political classes and stuff. But sometimes I look back at some of the things I wrote or said and was like, wow, that was really idiotic. You just <laughs> sound dumb, but you know, or you just sound ignorant, you know? And so sometimes I think, I think especially like as it was well, a hard thing because, you know, you're like, oh, women need to speak up more and not be quiet. But at the same time, white women don't need to be the loudest <laughs> so you know yeah. lots of stuff like that where it's like okay you could just why don't you shut up and listen sometimes you know right yeah but it's hard balance because you don't want to shut up in the face of men but you also mm. you know whatever you want to give space um and not act like you know everything when you certainly do not yeah. um so stuff like that i guess um there's got to be more i don't know yeah i guess I would I feel like I have a lot of punk damage and that I still sort of seem to be oh you know you can't you're not supposed to make money off your art and all that kind of stuff so yeah, I have right. a hard time getting paid or or asking for what you deserve. I, I'm worth or deserve or yeah. or even just what other people are getting or peers right. or whatever and I I didn't build a path towards any of that really I mean I'm not saying oh poor me I'm I'm super broke and down and out but I'm just saying like I definitely didn't figure that out <laughs> yeah so. oh and the main thing I wish I'd done was I wish I'd kept a journal or a diary the entire time I have the worst memory I don't remember hardly anything and now <laughs> I want to write a book and do book stuff and I'm just like well, I don't know you know <laughs> <laughs> that happened I think <laughs> yeah so I that that's also a thing write it all down um time to die you're next oh that's a very dark <laughs> title uh wants to know what has changed in the riot girl movement from then to now and uh that has made space for women and people of color what do you think has okay well of... hopefully everything's changed but yeah, right? you know, we're in a different <laughs> era and all that um i think I mean, it's hard for me to say because I don't even know what Riot Girl is now. Like, I'm not really that aware of groups and what people are doing. So I see it more as a certain era, maybe even certain place and time. Totally. Um, kind of, I don't know. But at the same time, I don't want to um, 
discourage or dismiss people who identify with right girl or kind of that kind of thing now and are doing their own things but i mean if we're talking about kind of punk rock feminism and stuff i definitely think it's more diverse now and i think that that's important and um also i i do think well, I, I don't even think it. It's true. Riot Girl was very gendered. Now, at the time, we felt like we had to be like we're up, we're up against these like rich white men or whatever. Totally. Um, but still, you look back at the way we were kind of framing everything, and it was super gendered. And I think that things are way less gendered now and um, more like gender fluid. And I think mm -hmm. that's great. That's important. And um, we need to, you know, we are, people are changing the language on that. I mean, yeah. and sometimes I find it's hard for me, not totally, but hard for me sometimes to get language and things right um, because of that being so entrenched in genders in that era. Even yeah. though we're fighting the quote unquote good fight, you're just like, well, you, you don't, we should, we need to stop thinking of things in a binary. So Anyway, yeah. no, I mean, that's, a, that's a great point. Yeah. So stuff like that. Do you think that the right girl movement would have happened in the same way if we had access to social media at that point? Wow. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it would be different. I don't know. But I'm, I, I don't know, like, because I'm, of course, I love the convenience of a lot of things digitally mm -hmm. that we have now that we didn't have then. I mean, God, booking tours. <laughs> like, no, not with the typewriter and a fax machine. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and calling yeah. people totally. at long distance, which is really expensive, trying to get them to call you back. So you call while you think they're at work, all that. <laughs> so it's on their dime. Um, yeah. I sent postcards to confirm all the dates and everything. It's just ridiculous. And finding out a show is canceled when a month there. later when you get oh, there. No. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. or even yeah. just if you have like a date with someone and they don't show up and you're stood up and you find out later they had something they had to do an emergency, but you don't find out till you could get home and listen to your answering machine. Yeah. So <laughs> like, you know, whatever. So a lot of stuff like that. But um mm -hmm. anyways, but one thing I did want to say also on kind of the, the diversity angle too is I think what's important is that from the inception that um, the organizers, the people who are starting something, that that is diverse. Because also, because people just don't, people don't want to become part of something if they weren't, they aren't central to it. Like if they mm -hmm. weren't the originators or it's not really their main idea or whatever, you know, right. or, or it's not their experience or whatever. So I think that that's important. And I think that's also what's happening. I mean, yeah. but, you know, I think you have really important groups right now like i mean that are really big but like black lives matter and stuff like that that is just so inspiring and so important i mean just beyond necessary so yeah. you know there's bigger fish to fry and things like that um but i still believe in cultural activism and people mm -hmm. having something to say in their art and music too of course and i think that yeah we anyways whatever <laughs> wait but that's not a good answer whatever no i mean i <laughs> but, mean you all were so instrumental in in laying the groundwork for people to feel like they could do those things mm -hmm. so i mean that's that's definitely in your wake for sure yeah yeah and i mean and i also would like to just say that i feel like i owe a lot to kathleen hannah really who really spearheaded it the most yeah. And she was the most, um, she's just one of those people who never stops. She's always has to be doing something. So she made so much happen yeah. or instigated so much. Yeah. And that's and, such a good descriptor for the rat girl movement. <laughs> Instigators. <laughs> yeah. 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 And disruptors and things like that. But yeah. 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 I love that. Um, at Kamiki wants to know how have your values changed from the OG movement? transfer to today's social climate, if at all? Um, oh gosh, I don't know. It's hard because you live with yourself every day. So you don't always see how you've changed. Yeah. But well, one thing I said is, is that gender binary, I think yeah. is like trying to, you know, deal with that and not be, you know, not think that way and not have things framed that way is something that at least I'm trying to do. Um, and um, I don't know. Yeah. And like, try, you know, not be focused on i don't know like 
feminism just from my own experience or something, you know, and yeah. try to look broader. And, and I think it's important that the people leading feminist organizations and things like that um, are not like straight, white, uh, yeah. cis, whatever, you know, like, mm -hmm. so that's also important. And I mean, I, I'm not saying I was against that back then, but I don't know, <laughs> just seeing it more, realizing a lot more now. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Things are so different. It's like digital. Everything's digital now. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I just thank God that we didn't have yeah. social media back then. Because ever, you know, we were constantly, you know, ragging on people and whatever. And zines, <laughs> I can't imagine it exponentially. Like, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Even, I mean, I, even I, for I, us, I think I'm glad there wasn't social media. When we were in high school and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I just I can't imagine what the keyboard warriors would have said. Oh, my God. The right girl movement, you know, just like that boys club versus the girls club. And like you guys taking on and playing a show that you like maybe didn't have the chops to play initially. But somebody was like, hey, do this thing. And you guys were bold enough to do it. But, yeah. you know, it. It, it's so easy to pile on behind the keyboard that it's it, I feel like that was such a microcosm of that time too that it was just like no it, we're just we're doing this thing we're all yeah. fired up and it's awesome and well also fear like fear of whatever because I even think about posting things sometimes that I don't know what it is just anything and I think twice about it right because yeah, it's going out to so many more people of yeah course. whereas when we were making these zines you just scribble it out and you know, you know photocopy yeah. it you know 100 with, times <laughs> yeah with a stolen kinko's card or whatever did um, you save any of those oh i still think i have my kinko's cards i am i even <laughs> had one of those blocks with the number counter on it somewhere somewhere <laughs> but i love those but um yeah so i don't know yeah i think that there is something about that extreme access to everyone and everything all at once and like social media that exponential audience or whatever that makes might make people a little bit more fearful of expressing themselves mm -hmm. um i think it would have done that for me and i don't know if i would have started a band i mean i had to leave olympia to even think that i might be able to start a band it's definitely <laughs> in olympia i was probably even too afraid of what scenesters there would think of me you oh, know? i mean that, that was the scene of the scenes in the 90s for sure <laughs> like <laughs> well when i started it wasn't really yet yeah. But maybe sort of. Well, one thing is Olympia was important because uh, Seattle had these city ordinances that were shutting all the venues down and everything mm -hmm. like you couldn't dance if you're not 21 or whatever. And uh, definitely couldn't. Yeah. Anyway, so all ages thing was super screwed in Seattle. So yeah. people a lot. Usually we met in the middle in Tacoma. There was this great place, Community World Theater, um, Community World Theater. Yeah. Um, Nico Case worked the door. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was great. That was mostly in the eight, late 80s. Um, yeah. But I'm sure into the 90s too, I think. I don't know. Um, but yeah, but a lot of things had to happen in Olympia and Tacoma because Seattle was often shut down. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's those are those are little building blocks that I think sometimes people don't realize, right? It's that there was, there was these weird political things that all kind of lined up in the right ways to put all of these like-minded people together in the right way to just kind of nudge them towards doing this amazing thing. So, and you had to show up so much of it, so much of a yeah. scene is just the hang and yeah. talking outside the venue or on the sidewalk or whatever, you know, yeah. or at yeah. parties, whatever. So I think that was also important too. Like, I think people still want to go out and meet up in person, of course, but I think it, things were so much more regional back then. Yeah. music and scenes and especially the northwest it was very sleepy back then and you didn't have national acts coming through very often mm -hmm. people find that hard to believe but no so yeah. you know your heroes are your hometown heroes you know totally yeah, yeah. well um one more question and then we'll ask our final one but the um, the one beforehand is uh from michelle kaufman she wants to know what your first album on vinyl was oh uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, probably one of the first records I bought as an adult um, with my own money probably was 
late i don't really know but i know that when i moved to eugene to go to college there was a great record store there i can't remember what it was called but um i bought two records and i maybe at the same time i'm not sure but i bought the vaseline's um ep that's pink it's got like dying for it jesus don't want me for a sunbeam molly's lips and what else on there anyways um and i bought that and then i also bought the shop assistants so Wow, both bands I think are from Edinburgh, Scotland. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the Shop Assistants, I bought that album, their first album, I guess, or whatever. Um, maybe it's their only album. I don't know. And um, both of those records I still have, and I love. And yeah, the Vaseline's record, Kurt Cobain was always trying to get off of me. He knew I had it, <laughs> and there, and it was hard to get, I guess. But yeah. I can't tell you how many of his friends were like, Kurt really wants that. And I was like, well, team band. Tell, <laughs> tell him to go buy it. <laughs> I know. I want it more. I mean, yeah. this was early on. I don't think they were that big yet, but whatever. <laughs> Anyways. Um, but yeah, I still have it. So to end our incredible conversation, uh, we, all <laughs> we ask the impossible question that is, if it's it's worse than the the desert island question in my opinion and that's why we came up with it if uh -huh. you if you were to make one seven inch record and you could put anything on the a side and anything on the b side and it is a custom bootleg what would that seven inch record be oh do you mean like with which artist or something yeah. like that mm -hmm. what artist what song yeah <laughs> i know it's <laughs> the hardest question in all, of all time well probably patsy klein would have to be on one side there we go. Because yeah. I could just listen to her sing the shit out of anything. But like I but some song that she's never done before, maybe some something deep, deep cut. Yeah, something. Um I, I was about to name a song, but I think she did do a cover of that. But anyways, um, <laughs> I don't know. Like maybe like it's who knows? Maybe Patsy Klein on one side and Linda Ronstadt on the other. I don't know. Oh, nice. I mean that <laughs> That that is iconic. That is iconic. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. Awesome. Well, this has so been so great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Austin. I can't. Oh, you know, can't tell you how me. rad it is to have you on here. It's, oh, yeah. I hope I came yeah. across okay and oh. didn't bum anyone out. But yeah, no way, <laughs> not at all. Quite the opposite. I feel like people will be more fired up in the way that um, they should be always yeah. i mean that's that's exactly what we're what we're after on our podcast and in our organization and our, our daily lives that's what we're trying to do is spearhead it make make it make it better right yeah so. carry it cool. on yeah. yeah well i'm happy to be talking also to canadians and <laughs> i'm sure my, my sister cindy wolf and her hubby boyfriend red <laughs> They're the, they're the documentary film people, but anyways, they're Canadian and they they'll probably listen to this too. So. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> well, if your if your twin sister wants to put out a record, you just you uh -huh. and we'll figure awesome. it out. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I really think she should. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we can make it happen. <laughs> um, that's wicked. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Well, well thank great you. rest of your night. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Super appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Okay. You too. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thanks for joining us on the Women in Vinyl podcast. You can join our ever-growing list of sponsors, other record labels, Selector, Couple Design, Eargasm, Groove Washer, Glowtronics, New Gen Audio, and ba -ba -ba -bow! Vinyl Revolution Record Show. And thanks for sponsoring the show. Um, hey, as always, you can join our conversation on Instagram or send us a note at media at womeninvinyl.com. Clock us, send us info. If you have a question, yo, we got the answer or we'll find it. We won't lie to you. And check out womeninvinyl.com for past episodes, the store, the job board and the library of resources. Don't forget to like and subscribe and give us a review on your favorite podcast delivery method. You can also contribute to furthering our mission at patreon.com slash women in vinyl. Hey, guess what? This episode, 45 minutes. You know there was more. You want more? You get more. Go to patreon.com and you can get more. And you'll find all the B-sides, the deep cuts, and the amazing extras, including longer episodes, 
and contribute to the creation of scholarships and educational opportunities to further the demystification, the infiltration of more women and non-binary identifying humans into the final making space. Decrease in those turnaround times every week. Yeah, we love your records. We want you to love them too. Womeninvinyl.com. This episode has been brought to you by Women in Vinyl and Red Spade Records. Thank you for listening. Please remember to subscribe. And you can always contact us directly by visiting www.womeninvinyl.com.